what's up everybody oh hold on this happened last week too <laughs> uh, what's up everybody matt tobacco from spoken tobacco.com i'm joined once again with my friend mr john carney who's over there showing down on something what do you got over there john i'm eating filet mignon topped with <clears throat> grilled pancetta Ooh. and uh, a side of brussels sprouts with balsamic glaze um grated parmesan cheese diced pancetta onions it's awesome i'm starving it's the only thing i've eaten today i forgot to eat you only eat on a cutting board is that really like your thing you just eat on a cutting board well I, it's one of my business ventures so it's like it's, it behooves me to to eat on the things that i'm promoting <laughs> yeah, i only take pictures of food on cutting boards on wood butcher cutting boards and i only eat on them it's the only thing i do i actually eat on them and take more pictures of them than the actual wood butcher himself does he doesn't even use his own boards really no, he's, he's too scared to because they're like pieces of art. He doesn't want to ruin them. Well, I guess that makes sense. Well, we have two people with us. Uh, one of them is going to be a show mainstay, and one of them is a special guest. So first, I just wanted to take a moment to announce that we have Smoke and Nicole uh, making her debut in the producing chair tonight. Even though I'm kind of doing the controls for right now, she will be doing the producing of the show going forward. And so she is here with us. And we also have our special guest, Carrie Simpson, is joining us. Uh, cigar smoker. Smokes a lot of cigars. I think at one point she smoked more than me. I might have surpassed her now. Uh, and Carrie, you might have to unmute yourself now, now that we, uh, we're into the, if she can find it there. Actually, wait. Uh, uh, there you go. There we go. What's up, Carrie? Oh, thanks for inviting me. You, uh, what are you smoking over there? I don't know how to pronounce it. I can't even read that. How do you pronounce it, Tim? Is this oh, said Shugui? Shugui? I've Dose always... 77? John, do you know that one? I don't know that one. Yeah, I pronounce it with the hard H. Chogi. Chogi? Uh, this is one of the first boxes that I bought, maybe like six, five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like them when I bought them, so they ended up being a, a giveaway. Uh, but I was getting down to the uh, dregs of my travel humidor during quarantine, pulled one out because I keep a bunch of the ones that I don't like so I can give them to people that might like them. And uh, tried this one, and it aged beautifully. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, aging cigars, and that's something you know, you know, we talk about on here, and a lot of people talk about uh, you know, is, you know, when you go into a cigar shop and you buy a box of cigars, you know, there's certain brands, you know, that are more notoriously, you know, better for aging than others, even though all cigars really are good for aging. You know, you buy a box, you, maybe you smoke one, you see how it tastes, throw it back in the humidor, let it sit six months, a year, two years, and you'll notice the flavor profiles change and, and sometimes they get better and sometimes they get worse, but usually they get better as they continue to age and, um, they go through a whole process. And so, you know, yeah, sometimes, you know, you, I, I have that, I've had, I've had, I've been in that same spot, you know, I'll go into one of my cabinets and I'll pull a box out and I'll be like, I didn't even know I had this. And I'm like, how long? Oh, uh, <laughs> I have, I have uh, two coolers in Winnipeg and two coolers in Las Vegas. And then a 40 count that I travel around with. And every time I go in between countries, it's like, Oh, Oh, I forgot I had that. I forgot I had that. I forgot these boxes I haven't even opened yet. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely, I've been there myself and I, um, I, I like rediscover stuff and I'm like, Ooh, what is this? And then now it's been aging for like a year and a half. So now it's even better than, and I'm like, I smoke it again. I'm like, I don't think I like this. And then I'm like, it's not bad actually. Like I really like this, but you know, it, it sat for a year and a half since I smoked it the first time. So mm. those things can definitely happen. But um, aside from smoking cigars, you, uh, you're actually not in the cigar industry as a professional. You have your no. own businesses. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I own a telemarketing agency that supports technology manufacturers, distributors, and resellers. So companies hire us to do their outbound prospecting or to invite people to events. We're doing a lot of invitations to virtual events now since there hasn't been any physical events for a while. Right. Um, so, I mean, we did pretty well through the pandemic because everybody that had budgeted for live events now didn't have that um, 
channel for developing new leads and they weren't, um, I mean, you can't really hire a, a telemarketing team, train them and roll them out remotely when you've never had a, an outbound sales team before. So we, uh, we lost about 50% of our revenue kind of like month one. And then we're, we're not back up to where we would have been, but we're, we're doing pretty good. I'm pretty grateful. That's it's good. Been, uh, it's been I, a long three months though. Yeah. It's one of those things, you know, everyone's kind of dealing with it in their own special way. You know, obviously we talk a lot about how the cigar in industry has been affected. You know, John, um, in case you, I don't know how much you talk with John, but so John is from La Florida Dominicana. He is the vice president of sales. Um, so, you know, as someone in his position, you know, with, with a major manufacturer, uh, you know, having to lay off a lot of staff, you know, shut down their factory, the, you know, the box factory is shut down. So, you know, now you're, you're seeing some La Florida Dominicana stuff arrive in shops in bundles because the box factories are not open. They can't make boxes for these cigars. Um, so and how does that affect everything, John? Like, are people less inclined to purchase a box of cigars when they show up in a bundle? It's a really good question uh, because some of the retail <coughs> retail partnerships we have um, now all of our retailers have been very understanding of it. Unfortunately, we have a product that's in very high demand and we've done quite well in comparison to other companies in the industry during this. But uh, yeah, there's some products that I would say that a consumer would be averse to not buying in a box. One of the examples is in like an everyday cigar smoker will buy it if it's not in a box. But if you're buying something for a gift, um, something a little higher end, uh, you know, that I've had, you know, some people said, hey, I'll, I'll take these Andalusian bulls if they're in boxes, uh, because I have somebody who wants them as a gift. But if they're not in boxes, you know, the bundles that they're coming in, I'll, I'll just fill them in the box. But they somebody wanted them specifically for a gift. Um, but it hasn't been too much of an impact. It's, it's a temporary thing. It's really only been about two months. And then some of it, um, you know, some of it was some things have still been coming in boxes since we have them. Uh, so there's just a few higher end items and some more high volume SKUs. But no, there's there's been some pushback, but not really. Uh, as I said, it, it, most of the people just want to smoke a cigar. And if it, the quality's there, it's really about the cigar, not about the box. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for us, most of our boxes aren't very ornate. Um, so I've, I've had to, I've been able to have a good line with people where, you know, there's just really not a lot of, it's nominal, the cost of our boxes. It's, you know, it's a little thin box it's not a humidor or anything like that so it's been good but yeah there's been some pushback and obviously on a long-term basis if it were to go on much further which it's not now which is great um we would look at that a little differently but uh but fortunately you know knock on wood on my wood block uh fortunately it's been pretty smooth yeah i know i do like the elaborate unboxing of the uh the fancier labels like that opus um and my stuff that i did yeah, yeah. Like, you're not going to buy a lot of Opus if you don't have it in a box. Part of that's the pomp and circumstance around it. And we have cigars similar to that as well, uh, you know, where there's items where people are like, yeah, I'm not going to take that if it's not in the box. Like part of the part of the deal with that is people want the box and to open it and feel special. But somebody, you know, smoking an everyday cigar uh, for them, if it's their everyday smoke, a real niche market, uh, they really don't care if it's in a box or not. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree. I think there's... I think there are especially certain brands like Opus X, like the Andalusian Bull. I mean, even like the La Volcata. Like if you, you know, if, I mean, I guess if I really wanted them, I would buy them in a bundle. But I like that whole, like you buy the box. It's the, like, don't you have enough boxes at home now? Like just <laughs> buy them in a bundle, put them back in a box. You're fine. <laughs> I mean, I have it in like a display cabinet. So for me, it's like, I want to put the boxes on display. But yeah, I mean, if you. If you have to, you have to, but I can understand like how some, I can understand both sides of the coin where some people want that box because it's special to them or they want to display it in their cabinet or whatever. Or there's people who maybe don't have that and they're like, well, I'm going to stuff it into a boxing mudar anyway. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of personal preference, I guess, but yeah, I mean, I, like I, like I said, last week's show, you know, I was in a cigar shop and I saw on the counter, uh, Andalusian bulls in a cellophane bundle. And I was like, <laughs> never seen that before <laughs> and it was i've only bought those in single sticks anyway really mm -hmm. now what do you think of the andalusian bowl uh, i haven't smoked one for a few years but i enjoyed it it's pretty good it's pretty good i would say of the florida Dominicana, it's probably my favorite and then i don't know john we've talked about this i've gone back and forth i like the i like the lavocada a lot 
I like the Lahero. I think I like the Lahero more than the double Lahero. Um, then there's the 1994, and I had one of those for the first time mm. in six months, and I was like, oh, the 1994 fan cigar. I, I prefer the Lavocado over the Lenox, um, personally. I mean, they're both really good, but that's the one I prefer to smoke the most. I, I judged it because during the quarantine, I had one bundle of Lavocado, and it lasted like a week and a half, and I was down to like one, and I'm like, I can't smoke these things anymore. Because uh, I've been I've been locked in up here in Maine, uh, Carrie, for uh, since the beginning of March. Yeah, that's why that you, was my life too. Yeah, yeah. Not Maine though, Michigan. My Canadian accent as well. <laughs> Some things to say. I but, couldn't even smoke through quarantine though because I had surgery in December and they don't want you smoking for a few months before and a few months after. So I was already like dry spell into longer dry spell. So I've got this uh, enormous collection of cigars and it's not dwindling in any way. I gave away more cigars than I smoked through quarantine. Wow. The people who made fun of me for hoarding and stockpiling ran out of cigars because they weren't shipping them to Canada anymore. How did you find your palate when you returned uh, to smoking cigars, your first cigar? Was it like being... Oh. Like my palate hasn't changed, but my tolerance for nicotine definitely dropped significantly. Like I'm smoking a much lighter cigar than I normally would. I'm smoking what I would describe as like breakfast cigars right now. <laughs> like the ones that I would normally have uh, on vacation with coffee in the morning. Super mild. Before I've eaten anything. Or like I can't really smoke a full bodied cigar unless I've had like a huge steak dinner. And even then, if I get through more than like three quarters of it, I'm impressed. Like I can't smoke the the padrones. I can't smoke the um, really. Yeah, that, they they make me nauseous. Every padrone I've ever smoked, except for the Damaso. I haven't had the Damaso myself. I know John likes the Damaso. Uh, John likes the. Uh... Oh, you don't? It's a pretty mild Connecticut. Like I I I liked it like six years ago, but now it's a little light for my tastes. Hmm. I'm a huge Padron fan. I'm, I'm not a big mild cigar smoker in general. Um, I don't dislike the Maso, but it's not one of my go-tos. I maybe have one or two a year. Oh, uh, okay. I might have been thinking of something else then. That was my bad. But yeah, I mean, I Padron's are an interesting one for me because I do enjoy them. And, I, you know, and if it's part of, you know, being in cigars all the time. You know, you, you're smoking so many different things, and then you try to just – smoke your go-tos and then you're always trying new stuff and then people send you stuff and you got to try it and you forget about a lot of stuff that you don't like not like but it's just not something that you smoke all the time and so i i was in the shop like a couple weeks ago and i was standing in front of padrone and i was like you know what let me get some 64s some 26 uh the 85 and i'm like sitting there and i'm lighting up the 64 mm -hmm. churchill maduro and i'm like this is so good like how did i like forget about this like i just I love it. I mean, they're not. Uh, one thing I'll say about Padron is that visually, when you look at them, they're not the prettiest looking cigars, but they taste super good. rustic. Yeah, super rustic, but they taste phenomenal. I mean, they the the flavor is great. They just don't, you know, have the best look. But, you know, again, some every cigar is different. So, um, what's the one that they sell with the the, the hum humidor trays that you can you can restock with the the fiftieth? Yeah. So that that one. I bought those um, at an event. Uh, one of the one of the stores I go to in Phoenix had a bunch of them. I guess if people already have them stocked, they sell them back to the mm -hmm. retailer. So I bought some. I bought two for a celebration with a new client. I made about a quarter, not even a quarter way into that stick, and I was like, I had to leave. I was green, <laughs> and I was like trying to be super cool about it, but I was, like I was trying to, like sugar, like discreetly, like. <laughs> don't throw up don't throw up oh god okay i gotta go so that night was ruined what would you say i know you have a lot of different stuff but what would you say like your top three like go-to brands are like your like every everyday smokes just like every day doesn't matter just you smoke them like all the time uh the room 101 um not the farce although i do like the farce that just came out the one that came out before that the hit and run Yes, the mild. So that's one of my go-tos. Um, I like the archetype. And I know, like, they don't have a, a an Instagram or anything. The, the archetype, um, do you remember what they're called? I think I know what you're talking about. They're, uh, they have, like, a little pyramid 
Um, but I don't know who actually makes them. Um, a company called uh, Phillips and King, I believe. Oh, those are nice. I like those. Uh, I'm a big uh, Caldwell fan girl, so I usually buy any of the releases that come out there. And I like the I like that they're collaborating mm -hmm. with other people now. So I, I usually buy whatever you know limited edition thing they put out, and then I forget about it and come back to it later. <laughs> so there, um, I like the Eastern Standard. Okay. Um, we're still. I like like the Ashton Cabinet. Always been a big fan. Really, and I always took you as like really like, and a lot of stuff you are saying is like really boutique. -y, but I, I always took you as more of a solid boutique smoker. But Ashton, I don't, I don't know why. I just don't picture you as an Ashton smoker. But uh, good cigars. I mean, Ashton Cabinet. Well, we started with the um, like we started with the basic stuff, like the lower end. We first box I ever bought, I think, was the American Kick Ass Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then the CLE, uh, the Camacho Connecticut, I liked when I started, that was a go-to for a while. Mm -hmm. And then my palate matured a little bit and I moved on to trying other things. When I, I went to um, Lone Wolf in Santa Monica, Lone Wolf, is that what it's called? Um, that was like the first like fancier cigar store that I'd gone to. And I didn't realize that California taxed the sh shit out of you. So I spent way too much in California buying cigars. I would not do that again. <laughs> but the um, the owner there, I was like, oh, I don't like Maduros. I don't like this. I don't like that. And he's like, well, why don't you like them? I'm like, well, every time I smoke one, I feel sick. And he said, well, don't blame the cigar, Carrie. Like you're <laughs> like you need to explore a little bit, and you need to make like eat this and have something sweet. And he was just like, kind of took me on a tutorial of how to you know prevent that from happening, and then suggested a bunch of things. And like three thousand dollars later, I'm walking out of that store with. Uh, some really nice stuff, yeah. uh, but not recognizing that I'd way overpaid for it. So I usually buy and have shipped now. I don't usually buy. Um, my local in Vegas is En Fuego. Yep. And I uh, love those guys. Like modestly priced for Las Vegas and mm -hmm. anywhere else in Vegas, you're paying strip prices. And I mean. The problem with Las Vegas and as, as a local, you can obviously attest to this, is first of all, right off the bat, Nevada has a really high tobacco tax. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tourist driven state, really, for the most part, you have, you know, Las Vegas, you have Reno and, uh, and their, their tobacco tax is high. Uh, and then, like you said, you go on the strip and you go to any of the Davidoffs, you go to the Monte Cristo, you go to Ca Casa Fuente, which, you know, I, I'm a Fuente guy. I love Fuente, but you go to Casa Fuente and, you know, you're paying $50 for a Reserva de Chateau Opus X. I mean, or maybe more. I mean, it's, it's pricey, but you know, you're paying for, you're in Las Vegas, you're in Caesar's Palace at the Fuente store. And it's you're... not even like that, like as far as like a nice place to sit and smoke, it's like sitting in a shopping mall smoking. I'm not a huge fan of, uh, I don't mind buying and wandering. I love that you can smoke everywhere in Vegas, but if I had to choose, I'd go hit up the Davidoff outside Fashion Show Mall because they've got that beautiful round patio. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not like a huge Davidoff fan. I buy most of their um, like year of the releases. And then the, the boxes that you can only get in certain cities. So I collected those for a little while. Yeah. They're not my favorites, but they're like, they're a solid cigar and you can buy them everywhere and they're consistent. So whether we're in Japan or Las Vegas, you can buy the same sticks and you know what you're getting and it's not, it's reliable. Have you ever been to, uh, what's the one at the Mirage? Is it the, the room bar? Have you been? Oh, room bar is a fabulous place to smoke. That's like one of the best people watching yeah. lay back enjoy everything like beautiful couches you can watch the game and then people just wander up and down the strip in front of you mm -hmm. drinks are solid um they're they don't stock many cigars though like they might have eight on the menu like all marked up about 50 percent. but you can bring your own sticks there okay yeah i don't i think i might have wandered in there once but i don't think i've really hung out in there um but it's it's definitely on the list you know next time i'm in town um, the chandelier bar at the Cosmo, like it's of that place. One of the nicest places to sit and smoke. <laughs> I know the Cosmo, like as as a whole, is like one of your favorite places in the whole city to be. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, that I uh, I definitely got to hang out there some more when I'm when I'm back in town. But uh, yeah, I mean Vegas is definitely a cigar city. It's a cool place to go if you're a cigar smoker. They're getting a little more strict about it though. Like you used to be able to smoke everywhere. And now they're limiting it to um, even the patio at Lavo wouldn't allow it last time we were there. So the clubs, um, 
I mean, not that there's any clubs open right now, but you can't smoke inside of a nightclub anymore. You have to go out by the pool, mm. which is nice, except that normally like the main stage is inside the club. So if you've got a table or something there, um, you've got to like go out. And if the bar's at capacity, they're not letting you back in. So you're kind of like, oh, stuck there. Yeah, that's definitely not as, you know, that's, that doesn't make for a good time. Um, you can still smoke in Atlanta at all the clubs. And I like that. Oh, really? See, yeah. I haven't been to Atlanta yet. And I, I keep hearing a lot of good cigar related things about Atlanta. Um, actually, John, I think, aren't you going to Atlanta soon? Magic City. I was supposed to go tomorrow and then the governor declared a state of emergency and they activated the, the national guard in, in Atlanta and the conference I was going to was right downtown. So I'm just going to do a virtual, uh, but I'm in Atlanta. Traditionally I'm in Atlanta five or six times a year, uh, but there are some great cigar lounges and there's some great cigar clubs and you can smoke everywhere. And they got a really, really unique cigar culture in that city. Um, so I, I got some good friends that I do some, you know, we partner on some programs and things there. So, but no, Atlanta's a blast. Doesn't our new quarterback in uh, New England have a, a cigar bar in Atlanta? Like yeah, Cam Newton. It's called uh, Fellowship. We actually did a did a function with them during the Super Bowl this past year. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's when beautiful place. Yeah, hey, Cam's, Cam's a big cigar smoker. <laughs> yeah, I had I had heard that, uh, and I remember when you guys were all down in Miami during the Super Bowl. I remember Dave Dave Garofalo, uh, he took that photo with Cam Newton. I thought that was cool. Uh, and then now here he is. Now he's playing in New England. So, you know, we, uh, which, you know, we've been talking about and, you know, we're not really uh, talking football right now on the show, but, you know, we have been talking about it. We are excited. I think the Patriots just uh, posted like their little, you know, welcome to New England thing with Cam Newton, like photoshopped in the jersey. So it's. Yeah, they definitely posted that and all of his merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> so you can buy a Patriots Cam Newton jersey now. Is yeah. That they got the first 40 items on the, the pro shop. I got the email this morning. They're all Cam Newton things. Did you order your Patriots Cam Newton jersey yet? I'm not buying a jersey. I'm going to do a, uh, like, those three-quarter. You know, like, those baseball school baseball shirts? Those, like, three-quarter sleeve shirts? Oh, yeah. So I'm going to do one of those. It's a T-shirt, and it's got Patriots on the front, Newton on the back, and it's got blue sleeves, white white body. So I'm going to do that. I'm not going to get in. Uh, for more than one year, I'll definitely buy a jersey. Yeah, I uh, – I'm definitely I'm excited to just see see that whole thing play out. And I I saw someone today actually I was on Facebook and I saw someone post that they had just received in the mail their Tampa Bay Buccaneers Tom Brady jersey. And I was like, oh, okay, so we are now at that stage where we have to watch this happen. But you know what? He's not here anymore, so we've we've moved on. Yeah, I may very well buy a Brady Tampa Bay jersey though, just just for the sake. Because I mean, I'm a Brady fan, a Patriots fan first, Brady second. All right, enough. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody doesn't like Tom Brady or someone doesn't like football. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. I have no idea what you're talking about. You have to talk about football when you invite a guest who likes football. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie's really to the point. She, uh, she's got some fire. It's one of the things I like about Carrie. Hey, let it be known that Matt brought it up. I did. It's my fault. You can, you can punish me. But um, We do have a couple exciting things happening on the show today. We have a soap review. We do. Down. What kind of soap? So, uh, I do any kind of soap. Uh, today I have a soap that was handmade, and we'll get we'll we'll get into that when I do the soap review. I'm I'm making sure I get real dirty over here, so we can test it. But we got a soap review going on today, so that's a good time. Um, it's something fun uh, that I got into when the quarantine before the quarantine started and the corona was going on. In my travels, I would do uh, live soap reviews from airports. Uh, I'd review different soaps. Uh, terminal, I think it's D35. Uh, or D42 and look uh, and JFK's got the best soap I've ever used in my life. It's, it was transcendent experience. Like in the like just publicly in the bathrooms or. So, so this is you'll appreciate this. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think you're shy. Um, so I was I was doing them when I was walking around. I was like, oh, I'm going to do the soap review, blah blah blah. And I got I was getting given tips. Like people were giving me tips on where to go check the soaps out. So, uh, I, you know, I was doing live while I was walking there. And then I was like, you know what? The next episode we do, the next soap review I'm going to do when I get to A36, I think it was in Atlanta, I go, we'll go live and we'll do the live soap review. Not thinking when I walk in, I walk in live and I'm like, I can't do this. There's, there's mirrors all over the, the restrooms. Mm -hmm. Urinals on one side, people exposing themselves on the other. And then you've got mirrors all over the place. I'm like, I can't go into a live soap review with a bunch of urinals behind me in the busiest airport in the world. So 
I started doing the soap reviews after uh, leaving the restroom. You can go into the family, uh, the family, like the single stall ones, the ones where you can change your baby or, you know. Good point, Karen. Hook up. <laughs> they have different types of soap, uh, which is what I've found. So there's, like, you know, in Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, baggage claim 15, the men's restroom has three sinks. The first two sinks, one and two, have different soap dispensers than soap and the uh, than sink three. And sink three soap dispenser is the second best soap that I've ever used. The uh, Delta lounges have a nice uh, series of soaps. <clears throat> What's that brand? It's that blank and blank. Malin and Goats or something like that. It's like white and then the letter block letters with a plus on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good soap, and they have the hand lotion. I am a fan of the Devine soap at the W. Like, I stay at the W now just for their toiletries, so add that one. I'll mail you some. I have a stockpile of them. I, yeah, we'll do it. So it's called Devine? Devine's. It's an Italian brand. Um, just They make great products, and I found them through the W, so that was pretty decent marketing when you think about I assume they must... There must be some sort of concession for a hotel to carry a particular brand of soap. Yeah, I'm but sure contracts. Yeah. I feel like I spend four hundred dollars a night on the room, but I get about a hundred dollars worth of product every night. Just put it in my suitcase. By the time I come home, I have like ten pounds of luggage when I leave and fifty when I come back. Before he was president, I stayed at uh, the Trump in Las Vegas, and <clears throat> just because I wanted to see what their service was like and their gyms and whatnot and they had incredible toiletries too like they give you like an entire bottle of hand like like hand lotion i brought back like four full-size bottles of hand lotion uh that the, the, the conditioner was like some of the best conditioners it's fun when you find something nice like that and it does make a difference like you know it's like the pillows on the bed like if you're going to go in and you're going to give you good stuff you're going to use it and appreciate it mm -hmm. so carrie I, I do i take it that you you also are kind of a soap expert you, like specific to traveling i don't know that i'm a soap expert i uh i'm a hotel expert mostly because i'm difficult <laughs> <laughs> like it takes so little to turn a like mediocre hotel into a great stay i don't know why the like cheaper hiltons and marriott's and whatever aren't just nice towels and nice toiletries makes a huge difference even if your shower is crap yeah. Usually I just travel with my own stuff now anyway. I found um I found a bar soap, like a bar brand where you like they have soaps and they have like a exfoliator, exfoliant and shampoo and conditioner. It's all in bar form. So I'm trying to get down to never checking a bag. So I prefer to use, like use a bar shampoo, use a bar conditioner. Hmm. And it's called Ecologic or something. I found it on Amazon. So it's interesting you mentioned that. So I I spend most of my time on the road. Obviously, this year I haven't. Last year I did 295 nights uh, in hotel stays. And it's funny you mention it because it does take so little. But these hotels are trying to limit, you know, shrinkage. If you have nice towels, people steal it. But if you do things the right way, you can limit that by not having too many towels. But one thing that I did notice is they are slowly upping their game on things. Because uh, like Courtyard Marriott now uses all Paul Mitchell products. Mm -hmm. And they have dispensers that are essentially drilled into the wall. So instead of the little, the little quantities of them in plastic balls or whatnot, they have the body wash. Yeah, I still find that skeevy. Oh, I love the Like somebody's got to put that stuff in. Like there is a lot of margin for gross things happening or True. just water getting into it and it getting like emulsified and disgusting. Matt, she is a soap expert. Well, that was like, okay, spas. This is a, so you go to a spa and they're using spectacular product. And then you go take a shower after your service and they've got this like shitty pump soap in the shower. Like, okay. It's not that I want to continue. Are you as bored about soap as I am about football? We can move on. No, he, but he's enthusiastic and we're, he's building a part on his site for me to actually put my soap reviews on. That's how enthusiastic he is about it. So, so is the point of the soap review is like, okay, how well does it take the smell of cigar off of you? No, 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 no. That's not one of the things. This has nothing to do with cigars whatsoever. Uh, we can actually, I can share on the screen right now if you'd like to see the uh, the actual logo for the soap review here. John, I th actually just hold on for a second. Um, I think it's a... <laughs> <laughs> 
So basically, there's, there's two things I need to say. So Carrie, welcome to the show. This is what we do. It is, we do talk cigars and we smoke on the, on the show, but it's a little bit of a variety and it's just kind of like anything goes. So yeah, somehow we just started doing John Soap reviews and we love it and people love it. So it's, how do you monetize that? Um, Affiliate we, marketing? Yeah. John, you want to pick up on that? <clears throat> so, so far it started off as, as part of my online LFD persona, essentially. So it was <clears throat> part of my LFD account. And I just stopped because I wasn't traveling. You know, I, I started doing this at the end of February, early March. So I maybe got five or six reviews in. And, uh, and then as a joke, Matt had sent me a bar of, like holiday soap that he picked up. <laughs> sent it with me with like some smoking tobacco stuff. And he's like, hey, I want you to review the soap. So I held on to it. So like two weeks ago, we finally did a soap review on it. And he's like, hey, he's like, do you want to keep doing those? Do people like them? Because they are funny. It's, it's, you know, it's hilarious. To, uh, the whole thing, even if you, I take it very serious, but it's just ridiculous to listen to someone talk about soap, how it feels on your hands and whatnot. And uh, so, yeah, we started going in. So I, I think the way to, I don't see anybody doing live soap reviews. And I'm sure that it's there or whatever, uh, but it's not like a mainstream thing. It's kind of a, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of a, like, if you're into it, you're into it. Um, so I think I kind of brought it to the cigar people and they were, they were into it because it was something different. And then I said the amount that I traveled, um, it was fun because I was always in different places. And so I, I don't really know how we're going to monetize it or if it ever gets monetized. I, I think for me, it's just been something that's fun and becomes part uh, something else that people want to maybe look and follow for the things that I do. Um, so hopefully it, hopefully it hopes, hopefully it connects people with me to a level where they want to smoke more cigars or they have something to talk to me about on another level other than cigars also i do a lot of cooking and you know i have a cooking show with some friends that we do um so yeah so i, I don't know hopefully it monetizes by giving somebody else something to watch uh, that we do because I, I think the personal connection with cigars is what it's about so if people can connect on things uh other than that like i i was shocked at how many people were into the soap reviews i did it one day as a joke just to, honestly i did it to mock corona at the beginning that was i couldn't have been more wrong right <clears throat> so i'm like oh no, you're the reason we're in lockdown yeah, yeah. The yeah, universe I, is punishing us because you made fun of the coronavirus. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's Corona time. And like <laughs> the Corona time song. And I'm like, yeah, let's do this. And I'm like, oh, we're here. And I was talking about the people around. Funny, though, the first thing I noticed uh, right in February and March, um, especially flying through Atlanta, which I, I think you maybe you're a Delta. You sound like you're a Delta girl. Yeah. Yeah. So you fly through Atlanta quite a bit and you fly through these hubs. And the thing I noticed the most early March uh, was there was just no there was no Chinese around none it was to an, to an untrained traveler you wouldn't notice anything different but I was first thing in March I'm like I'm flying through JFK doing a soap review and the first thing out of my head was there's like no Chinese there's just none uh, nobody was flying in this was I mean, even even before there was you know the travel uh, the travel restrictions I just there was a decline and you could notice it but so yeah so I was doing the sober and I was shocked at how many people liked it I was just like they're like oh this is awesome this is hilarious you got to keep doing it and uh and then the quarantine happened and I started drinking boxed wine and the soap just <laughs> stopped washing and bathing and it was that was it so Karen so question though at what point do you chuck the bar of soap are you using it right down to the bottom or like does it get to a sliver and then you just chuck it in the garbage and open a new one so um this is what I did. Uh, this is what I've done with, I've only done one bar soap review. Um, and that bar soap after I was done with it, uh, I did throw it away. Uh, so what I'm going to do is get rid of bars of soap. And what I think I might want to do is when I do do a soap review, I'll pick up two or three different bars of the soap and then we can do like a redux on it and review the soap at another time, maybe under different circumstances. Uh, but no, I have been eliminating the soap immediately after using it. Uh, Cause I have my own soaps that I use for myself. Um, but if so I you haven't found a soap so good that it's replaced your home soap yet? No, not yet. Um, the, the only reason I threw the soap away that Matt sent me was it was a seasonal soap. It, was, uh, it would fall in the category of a, of a seasonal holiday soap. And there's categories, too. We haven't created them all yet, but there are categories. <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to – one positive thing about it, I didn't want to smell like a pine tree and cloves uh, in the middle of the summer. Um, this is, so it was very Christmassy. So I, I just wouldn't have used that. Uh, um, but maybe at the holidays I would have kept it, but it was, it was a, it was a holiday, you know, seasonal holiday. So, uh, so today's would be, maybe be a little different. Um, this one today is Jasmine. Ooh. So John, really quickly, I wanted to, um, before we get too far off of the segment, cause I think it's a great way to, to bring her in is cause Carrie had mentioned spas 
and her experience. So Ka Carrie, do you, do you spend a lot of time in spas? Do you go to get a lot of spa treatment? No, I don't really enjoy massages and I'm not really good at making and keeping appointments. And I travel, uh, you know, as much as, well, I did travel as much as John did. So it's, you know, you've only got a finite period of time in each place. And I usually don't have four hours to go and like, I like to go to the spa if they've got like a nice um, wet area, like the sauna. Um, there's some spas in Vegas that have like, not, like huge hot tubs, but like the one at the Aria, they've got a huge hot tub that's the size of a pool up on a balcony and you go there and it's surrounded by foliage. So you can't actually tell, like you can't even tell where you are in the world at that point. It's mm. beautiful. Uh, but then on Saturdays, uh, they turn on the day club at Marquis and it all goes to shit. <laughs> I took my mother there for Mother's Day and like we just listened to oots, 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 oots the whole time we were at the spa. So it wasn't a, a great experience, but. So I think it's a good time to bring in Nicole because Nicole actually is joining us here at Smoking Tobacco and she's going to be kind of joining us on the show. And Nicole actually runs, there she is. Uh, Nicole actually runs an Equinox spa at the Ritz Carlton in Boston. So oh, I, just... I love the Ritz Carlton. So I just thought it was a great opportunity to just have her chime in a little bit. And you might have to unmute yourself a little bit. There you go. I mean, I didn't have too much, much to say, say but they do change those first bottles you were talking about out. <laughs> <laughs> so Ritz-Carlton changed their product line. They went from, um, oh, one that I really liked to a different one. It's a little bit different. Um, I, I, so I work for Equinox. So you've heard of Equinox. Um, and the location that I manage is the designated spa for the Ritz Carlton, so we are connected. So we are not a Ritz Carlton owned spa, but we are located within the Ritz Carlton in Boston. Um, but we use Kiehl's products in our uh, showers, um, which are made for Equinox, but they don't actually refill the bottles as far as I know. They like toss them and get a fresh, fresh So it's not like that big box thing on the wall with the lock on it in the shower? They have them because people, it's a gym. And even though it's two hundred or three hundred dollars a month, people do walk off of them. Not saying it's not their right, but <laughs> for that price. Um, but I mean, Kiehl's product is pretty decent. Um, but no, and then we up. So that's what the gym uses, um, and the spa showers are part of the gym. So there's a sauna and a steam room and all that. And occasionally, when I want to be nice or I get new product, and I upgrade with. Uh, more expensive products, so like Sanseuticals, skin Regimen. Oh, that's such a nice line. Stuff. That's what we use in the spa. Um, we use your hydrofacial, hydrofacial, hydrofacial products. products. Um, so, so I'll, I'll beef it up for my clients, but not for the general clients, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. so Carrie, if you do find yourself in Boston, and you, especially if you stay at the Ritz Carlton, but you don't have to stay at the Ritz Carlton. If you want, I can get you a good hookup at the spa. Because I do. I have the, a bucket list goal of staying at every Ritz Carlton in the, the world. Do you really? There's like, I think there's 360 of them. Mm -hmm. The best one I've stayed at so far is uh, Tokyo. Tokyo. Um, Kyoto was beautiful, but they didn't have a club lounge. And I think that's a big flaw in the system. This won't be your favorite. I can tell you that right now. It does lack the amenities of a typical Ritz Carlton because it's located in Boston, which is very historic. Um, and they don't have a lot of room. Like I said, they don't have their own spa. Um, but Equinox, the gym, um, they, they have a whole floor connected to the hotel. Um, and actually what's really cool is all the opposing Celtics teams um, that come to Boston, they stay at the Ritz and they practice in our gym. So we get a lot of basketball players in. Um, there's not a lot of nice hotels in Boston. Um, I mean, it's pretty much like the Four Seasons and the Ritz Carlton. So people are staying at one or the other. What about the Mandarin? Eh, it's okay. Man Mandarin. I think they're under construction right now too. Oh the yeah. Intercon the Intercontinental and the Westin there are pretty decent too. The Westin's more of a is more of a convention style hotel, but the Intercontinentals are all nice. So hmm. it's nice, but it's still not that classic. No. That classic hotel no. experience. F Four. Um, I. They're nice. Sorry, I was just going to say, I talked to the, the manager, and so if a, if a guest, guest walks by someone in their, in their lobby, and an employee hears it at the Ritz Carlton and says, there's not enough fresh flowers in here, they have up to $1,500 per guest per day to make their experience good. So I go love the consistency of that. It, their it's customer so good. service is top-notch, top and you top cannot beat it. 
No, and everybody's like it's identical the the experience. The only uh, the only Ritz Carlton I had a bad experience at was the one in Puerto Rico. What really? Was your, what was your bad experience? Um, in the <laughs> club lounge, me. the um, there were people fighting. Like uh, employees were fighting in the kitchen, and it sounded like there was a woman being sexually harassed. Like. Like, so she was like, like, don't touch me, go away, and like screaming really loudly. And I went downstairs, they're like, hey, I don't know what's going on up there, but somebody should check. And it was just like, it was just an uncomfortable vibe. And it was, I mean, it's Puerto Rico. So, I mean, the infrastructure there isn't fantastic. And the, the property was kind of old. The, uh, the pools are beautiful, but the rooms themselves, I mean, it was Ritz Carlton prices for a, you know, Denver Marriott experience. <laughs> hmm. I think it's safe to say that the theme on the show this week has definitely been travel. Hotel. That's because we're missing it so much. I know. And actually, John and I right now are actually supposed to be in Las Vegas because this was the week of the Premium Cigar Association trade show that we would have been at. And we would have been, what's today, Thursday? So, John, the show would have started, what, today or tomorrow? tomorrow? I think it would have started tomorrow. So we would be probably, right now, we'd probably be going out to dinner and then going to hang out at one of the bars in the casino. Um, and here we are. John's up in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. You're up in Canada. Also the middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. Like most people right now, there's nowhere to really go. I mean, like they opened, like, were you, were you, were you in Vegas when they started to reopen? So, but they haven't opened enough things, and it's inconsistent, so you um, you kind of have to do a lot of research picking where you want to go. Um, I went back to Vegas uh, to get Botox because Michigan kept everything in lockdown way longer. Uh, so the minute they opened Vegas, I was on a plane back to Vegas to get my hair cut. <laughs> the, um, the hotels that we normally stay at weren't open yet. So we tried the Sahara. The Sahara was open. It used to be the SLS, and the SLS is usually a phenomenal stay, but not so much. They didn't have the good towers open. They had the kind of like lower end tower open. We moved over to the Palace Station, which was consistent, same as always. The restaurants were all open there. They really, they haven't opened the clubs uh, at that point. Only a couple of the hotels had pools, like the Artisan. Have you ever been to the Artisan? I haven't been there myself, no. It's, uh, it's rough, but the... Uh, they have a European style pool there and it was the only pool, the only hotel pool open in Vegas. So we booked there just so we could use the pool. They were only letting guests in and we have a, a, an apartment across the street from it. So we just got the room so we could go hang out at the pool, but they, uh, like you couldn't, there were no restaurant, like you couldn't eat on site. You couldn't, um, the rooms weren't being cleaned. So right now, uh, we've, I've been to a couple of cities through the pandemic just for work. And uh, I mean, the hotels are charging the same rates, but there's nothing open. So we went to the W in uh, LA, in Bever Beverly Hills or Hollywood. Um, and the, the pool was open, but you couldn't, you couldn't even get a cup of coffee on site unless you ordered it through room service, so. Yeah, so they're being a little bit more. They're obviously being a lot more strict. Um, I remember seeing some one of the hotels I follow on Facebook posted that they did they they sterilized all their rooms and then they they like put some sort of seal on the door. So when you check in, you go to your room. It's supposed to be like no one's been in there since it was cleaned. And but then I was curious, like, so you have someone staying in there for four nights, and then did they still have room service come in every day and clean the room, or like are they? Nope. So they housekeeping uh, isn't supposed to go in there while you're occupying the room. So after you check out is when they clean it. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you're staying for a week, you know you they'll bring you the towels and the sheets and the whatever, but you have to make your own bed. And you're like, if I wanted to make my own bed, I'd be at home. Yeah. Um. And now in terms of uh, sorry, there's a moth over here that's just like out to get me right now. Um, now in terms of like the casinos, like how, like, like people playing casino games, like how, how is that? Uh, at Palace, the place was pretty busy. Um, Sahara was a ghost town. I walked through the Cosmo. It seemed busy-ish. The wind, the wind's doing a pretty good business right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's about all I've, oh no, the Venetian was open mm. and it seemed, uh, it was like normal there. Like all the restaurants were open. 
Uh, you have to make reservations, though. You can't just walk in anymore. Okay. What about when they um, – do they have, like, plexiglass at all the table games so you can't be, like, too close to the dealer? Like. Yeah, they did at some of the – some of the hotels had the, the stuff up. Mm. Uh, but they didn't have them. It wasn't, like, a peep show booth or anything. They just have, like, a – around like a thing that goes i suppose to protect the dealer from your filthy filthy face yeah. but it didn't it didn't take away from the aesthetic like they they did a nice job of, and a lot of the hotels when they had to shut down renovated so they're like nice new rooms beautiful spaces they uh they took the um, the volcano out of the mirage so that's gone oh it is yeah Oh damn! That was... But it's a beautifully landscaped. I mean, it always was, but now it's like between that and the flamingo, like it's almost a different ecosystem. Like you can go into that area and it's humid and a little bit cooler than everywhere else. So, yeah, yeah, we're definitely missing that right now. Um, you know, as you said, you know, regular travel is not a thing right now, so it it sucks. And we look forward to the day when we can just kind of get back to our our normal. Our normal ways of life especially with travel uh, you know, like i said we were missing out on a trade show this week um i think most of the john i think yeah you know, i know you don't go but i think inter tobacco in germany has been canceled as of now tpe is still on i believe correct for january when is it it's for january <clears throat> it's also in las vegas um but you know we'll see um yeah so you know it's yeah it, it's fun to talk about it because it's something obviously that people are are missing right now um, John, I know we started a little late, but we are at what normally is the overtime period. Um, did you, uh, did you want to get into your soap review now or you want to save that to a little bit? Later? We can save it where we were just going along right now. This is going smooth. It's enjoyable, relaxing. Okay. Okay. I just figured I would check in with you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like I always do. What do you, uh, I forget, I forget. What are you smoking over there? I I'm smoking an El Jaco Maduro. From our Reserva Special line, it's just about gone. And then I've got an Airbender Chisel Maduro that I'm going to light up uh, last as my nightcap. Mm. I just finished off. I, I didn't actually mention it before when I had asked Carrie what she was smoking, but I was actually smoking because uh, actually Carrie said, you know, she doesn't smoke a lot of Davidoff. I don't smoke a lot of Davidoff either. But the one Davidoff that I do really enjoy is the Late Hour, um, the Winston Churchill Late Hour. It's a great cigar. I have a box. I am probably, I got like maybe eight or nine sticks left. So I've been just kind of chugging along, maybe just trying to polish that box off, make some room for some new stuff. But I just finished that. And now I'm on to one of my everyday cigars, which is the Perdomo 20th Sun Grown uh, Toro, which I, I smoke a lot of Perdomo, especially the Sun Grown. It's some of my favorite stuff. Um, you know, we just had um, Nick Perdomo was here in New England, and he was at Two Guys Smoke Shop. Uh, actually, the whole Perdomo family was here for the, re for the release of the Firecracker Cigar um, that he did this year, and now he's getting ready to release his 10th, uh, the Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Sun Grown and Maduro that have replaced the Champagne Sun Grown and Maduro, the, the Champagne Noir, as it was known. Uh, and those will be coming out sometime in August, and we do have a a press release post right on smokingtobacco.com. You can go on there and read all about it with all the information and availability. Um, so there was, uh, there was one thing I wanted to mention, actually. And I just completely lost it. The, uh, are you smoking the Atabe over there? I am. Mm. Ooh, nice choice. I know. She, I, she, she, I don't know. She jumped off here. Where is she? There she is. So I'm she, back on. <laughs> so she, she's actually drinking champagne over there. Mm -hmm. And she asked me, she's like, what am I going to smoke with my champagne? And I was like, well, what kind of champagne you have? And it was a, it's a rosé. And I am actually drinking it myself. But if you follow us on social media, we've been drinking a lot of champagne. So her friend got her that as a birthday present. And so I said, you got to smoke it out of bed with that. Yeah, I'm drinking the rosé. I can't say it, babe. What is um, it? I have the like, box right know. here. The Lorraine Perrier? Yeah. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not really good with pronunciation, especially. I like it. It's pretty. Yeah. It comes in this, uh, that's actually pretty interesting. It comes in a tin box. This is actually, this is a metal. It's not your standard cardboard, like, uh, like the buff or the, the drum on. It's actually metal. Well, I had to do it justice with an Atabay. So. Yeah. That's what I, I have, have some cigar questions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. I have, uh, I usually buy, if I, if I haven't tried something yet, 
I'll buy single sticks. Usually I'll buy like a handful of them and they end up in my coolers and I just have them kind of flopping around in like Tupperware containers. Okay. Um, but I'm noticing like as they bump up against each other, they're chipping a little bit. Like how do you store single sticks if you don't have a, you know, I, I can't seem to keep the humidity in my, I've got like a, a hundred count or 200 count like glass top that I've never been able to keep it um, stable. So I just went with the coolers because I'm not really around all that much to babysit my cigars. When you, what do you do to keep them from? When you say coolers, are you talking about like the, the, like the, uh, like the wine cooler type humidors? No, just like, oh, like, a, like marine coolers. Oh, like a, like a plastic tub kind of container. Yeah. And I throw the big bobadas in there and mm -hmm. so just leave them. For me, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, I would say number one, the biggest thing with any kind of humidity control is you want to have a good seal because obviously the idea is to keep that humidity inside the environment. So if you're having a hard time with the humidity, you might be, are you, are you usually running? No, I had a problem with humidity with the humidor. So the, the cooler is like the humidity stays pretty stable as long as I'm not opening, like in Vegas, especially you can't just open and close and open it. Like you have to just leave them. Right. Um, but I've found like the, the, the sticks are like just the foot of them or whatever is getting um, chipped is the only way I can describe it. Like little bits of the wrapper are kind of rubbing off on them. It's like they're banging up against each other. Right around yeah. the wrapper, it just starts to chip. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd have to see, I'd, I mean, I'd have to see exactly how they're being stored. But if they're cellophane, number one, if they're cellophane cigars, Usually it's better because that cellophane acts like a barrier. If they're the mm -hmm. uns, like especially, so I, I assume maybe you could be talking about not necessarily, but is it more so with a lot of Cuban cigars? No, I keep the Cubans in like a um, a travel humidor with the the squishy stuff in the lit. Like they, I don't have a huge Cuban selection. It's not like I've got a cooler full of them. I maybe have a couple of boxes stockpiled from. You know, early purchases. The Cubans in my, like, I like Cuban cigars okay, but I usually, they're usually client gifts because you can't get them in the U.S. and uh, people seem to like them, but for my money, for the same price, there's, I think there's better, like this, I'd rather buy a Saint Pere than a Cuban cigar any day. Right. Yeah. I was, I was actually going to uh, deflect this one over to John and get his opinion. Um, because I was curious, but I don't know if he I don't know, is he still with us. It looks he like, looks a little frozen. He does look a little frozen. I'm not sure what happened there, um, but yeah. So I would say, if you use the tubs, as long as you have a good seal and you have the packs in there, that's good. In terms of them rubbing up and chipping on each other, that will happen. I would recommend. You said you have them like individually, like containered inside the tub. Yeah. Well, I've got you know probably four big Tupperware containers just with single sticks in and the ones I buy in the boxes I leave in the boxes but I often don't know if I want to buy a box yet so I'll buy some and you know some to smoke right away some to smoke later right but now they're all jumbled up together so every time I want to go choose something I'm kind of like okay what's what's in what's this what's this and then you know by the time I get around to smoking them I'll light one up and it'll be like the wrapper will be cracked or chipped or just enough to just enough to be annoying not enough to ruin the cigar but yeah, John. So, um, I don't know if you have any uh, insight on 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 cigar storage and humidors. That you might want to touch on, but basically, the biggest thing I pick up out of that is going to be um, the. I mean, especially when they're handled. When they're handled all the time, uh, yeah, they can chip. They're gonna break. They they roll around a lot in those containers. Um, that definitely is gonna cause that. So, my biggest thing was I don't know. I don't know why it's jumping over here. Sorry, I just, uh... oh, I thought I froze for a second. I'm sorry. Um, but no, yeah, I would say, like my experience, I have, I have cabinets. I have, a, I have a smaller cabinet that I have all my singles in, and then they're in, all in drawers, and I just try to stack them. And then as I use them, I, I just I slide the drawer out, and I, I kind of pick. What I'm hearing is walk-in humidor. Walk-in humidor? Yeah. It's time to build a walk-in humidor. I'm I'm getting to that point. Uh, I do have to, I have I have uh, I have quite the collection now, 
but oh, so maybe I'm gonna need one. Maybe some maybe someday when I have my own house, I will uh the one like a closet size just walk in. I've actually seen some some ideas online. Uh people actually build them in their house, but yeah, I would probably recommend that if you have the space. Um but yeah, like for me, I I I haven't really had that issue. I I I keep the I keep my singles in a smaller cabinet. I keep my boxes in a in a in a tower display. Um so usually I'm okay with that. But I don't know if John John, have you ever uh, have you ever had any issues with uh, your cigars, you know, chipping and cracking on the wrapper just while they're in storage? No, and, and, but you know, I traditionally keep everything cellophane. So if I, same thing, I'm not around my humidors. Mm, and we lost them again. I don't know what's going on up there in Maine, but uh, I think the the Wi-Fi signal is a little. Oh. He's kind of back there again. This is sometimes happens with him. I can hear you guys. Can you guys hear me? Oh yeah. Now yeah. we can. Oh yeah. You get you were freezing. Well, I I keep my things mostly cellophane. My cigars. Um, so I I don't traditionally have too much of an issue with that. And then I try to if something that's uncellophane, I try to keep it in its box, mm -hmm. um, as much as possible. Um, or if it's uncellophane, I'll put it in its in a little bag, uh, on its own just to kind of keep it as safe as possible. I mean, it can happen. Things move around. Just if you go in and grab a cigar, the cigars can move. So I, I try to keep everything either in cellophane, in a box, and if I can, I, I put them in their own individual bags. Yeah, bags is a really good idea. I would I would recommend that. I can't believe I didn't think of that myself. But if you can maybe bag some of them, especially like by, by you know, like the ones that are the same, you can bag them up inside each of those containers. That'll that'll cut down on that rolling around, banging around, shipping. Um it's also good for the humidity too. You know, they're in a bag that plastic creates like its own little bubble inside there. Uh, so it also will help with um, the humidity and, and the, the, why am I, why am I, oh my God. The, uh, just the overall conditions of the environment. Uh, Cause the humidor essentially is like an ecosystem, you know, when they are in there because you, know, you have your temperature, you have your humidity, and then you just have all the aromas from the other cigars and the wood. If it's an, you know, humidor that's lined with cedar and all of that. So, uh, no, no, we're just like marine coolering it. We're not, uh, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. So, yeah, I would def definitely recommend the bags. I think that would, I think that might help you a lot, and I'd be interested to see how that that pans out for you. I will let you know. I'll have yeah. to go now. I have to go buy some more cigars so I get bags for them. Yeah, that's you know, there's no, there's no with buying more cigars, especially if you're gonna smoke them. But uh, <laughs> I know a lot of people who buy a lot of cigars and they only smoke like five percent of them, so they end up. Oh, I uh, I feel that in my soul right now. Yeah. Like I, in my mind, I was gonna smoke a lot of cigars, and I just like I maybe like on a like long long night, I might be able to smoke two cigars, but I am not going to feel good about myself the next day. Mm. Like it's gonna sit right here and. My throat will hurt and it's just not, it's not worth the fallout. I might smoke half of, see, when I first started smoking, I would cut my cigars in half and I got scolded for it. So I don't do that anymore. Oh, that's a, that's, yeah, yeah. That's kind of a no-no. <laughs> I know a guy who, who recommends to people buying Lanceros, you know, because they're long and they're thin and then cutting them in half and having two short cigars out of it. And he, I've watched him get his hand slapped so many times for recommending that to people. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of a no, no, unless you have to, but, um, that sound parade double Ligero. Remember that? Like that is a phenomenal cigar, but it took me three days to smoke that. thing. <laughs> yeah, I have, I definitely have some, I have some long cigars myself. I actually have, uh, what do I, I have Fuente A's, I have LFD Lajero A's, I have the Byron A, the Aristocratus line, which is phenomenal. Um, it's not quite an A, it's like eight and a half. A, a solid A is like nine, nine and a half inches. Uh, so super long sticks. So, and I've been getting into those lately myself. Not sure why, but the really long smokes have just been intriguing and I've enjoyed them. I'm sure I'll get sick of them eventually, but I just, I'm not there yet. Um, what I did notice as I look behind you on the wall, you have some Drew Estate swag. I do not. I am in someone else's smoking lounge and he is a Drew Estate fan. I, uh, I get a lot of like free stuff from the stuff that I order from Fox and Phoenix. They're always good for sending over ashtrays and t-shirts and lighters and but I don't end up keeping any of them. What do you do with them? You just give them away as gifts? Yeah, just, it's not, I, I have like, 
a couple of ashtrays in Vegas. I have a smoking lounge built into my office. We have an old bank vault there. Mm. So I had, I got an industrial grade smoke eater to put in there. And like, it's, it's nice. Cause you can shut the, you shut the vault door and a couple hours later, you can't even tell that you were smoking in there. But uh, while you're smoking in there, it's pretty brutal because it doesn't uh, aerate the way that it should. <laughs> I was going to ask you, like, I'm intrigued by that because I've seen the ads for some of those. I haven't seen one in person myself, but the, that box you mount on the wall and then it's supposed to filter out all the smoke. I was, I was yeah, I was going to ask you how well that actually works. Is it really worth it? Pretty good. Um, like, I'll, I'll smoke a cigar, like, for, I have an apartment built into my um, office. Hmm. So I like sleep there when I'm in Vegas, which is only probably a handful of days a month right now. And I'll smoke, like everyone will go home. I'll go sit in the vault, smoke a cigar, turn on the, um, the air purifier, leave the door shut all night, come back in the morning. It's fine. Wow. That's pretty, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. I'm going to have to keep that in mind. for. Uh... And I use one of those ashtrays that has the uh, filter built into it. So it pulls the smoke down through the filter. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, those are cool too. Yeah, so I mean, I've seen, I've actually seen photos of, of your uh, and some short videos of your bank vault slash little hangout room you have, and it is it is cool. I I love the concept. I've I've seen you really get down and party in there, even by yourself. That's the one thing. You're you're not afraid to be like, I want to party, but there's no one around, so I'll just party by myself. And you still seem to have a great time. Like you don't need really anybody to have a good time which is because no. uh, I love about you. You seem to really uh, just enjoy as you navigate through life um, as I watch you on social media. Um, I'm leaving social media. The only, I went back onto Instagram because of lockdown, but I left Facebook six-ish months ago and I had to wean, like, I actually had to wean myself off of it. I realized how much time I was spending on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and, and then there's more. It's like, I can't keep up. I'm too old for TikTok. I'm, but the, I, like I was spending way more time on social media than I was in real life. Uh, when I looked at, I started tracking it on my phone first when I was thinking about changing my behaviors and I was spending hours and hours and hours on social media. So I set like a timer on my phone so I could only go on for a couple of hours a day. So I kind of had to like choose carefully what I wanted to do. And then I set my phone to turn off completely at 10 o'clock and not turn back on again until seven in the morning. So my, uh, my sleep habits got significantly better. I started reading more. I got more accomplished at work. And then the pandemic hit right when I left everything. And I went back onto Instagram because that was really the only way to see what other people were doing. Yeah. But uh, I'll be, I'll wean myself off again po uh, leading up to, we're actually going to go, we're going somewhere. I'm taking my kids to Cancun. I can't wait. When are you going to Cancun? Uh, July 19th. Oh, that'll be there's a new uh, dreams resort there that we're going to go check out for a few weeks. Hmm. Yeah, you you um, you actually go to you go to Cancun frequently, don't you? I was supposed to be um, I was supposed to travel for a full year starting at the beginning of June. Uh, I teach yoga through a, a group that books instructors at resorts for free holidays. Hmm. So, I mean, I pay a very moderate amount to be able to bring my family or my husband or friends with me. And, you know, for a vacation that most people are spending $5,000 a week on, I'm paying like less than 10% of that for my entire family to be there. Mm. So it's, it's cheaper than rent. So I'd plan to just like bop from resort to resort to resort all year. It was already booked. It was already paid for. And now I'm having to push everything. So my, I was supposed to be in Puerto Vallarta right now surfing with my kids. We had like an eight week trip booked there. I had to push that. So now I have my next summer booked out already, but any uh, any of the dreams, secrets, breathless. Uh, I think Zoetry is in their line as well. I have teaching privileges at all those resorts, so I just kind of look it up and decide where to go. So I'll be teaching at the. They have a new Dreams Vista that just opened in Cancun, and it's brand new. And they can only sell the thirty percent capacity right now, so there there won't be anyone there. There'll be no lineups. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. That's. Uh, I I wanted to. I, there's so many places I wanted to travel this year uh most of them domestically but um yeah I'm, I'm i'm feeling it too it's like like i just said you know we were supposed to be in vegas for the trade show but i was also planning on going down to florida you know hitting orlando miami you know those areas corona 
Ah, uh, Corona, yeah. Corona is like just God's country. I love it there. Yeah, he, uh, that's that's uh, that's Jeff Borschwitz. He owns Corona Cigar. Uh, great guy. That's that's a that's a. I haven't been there yet myself, but I know I know all about it, and it, it is it is quite the place. I I I've been told that down in the south, it's that is the that's the place. Uh, that's yeah. The one on Doctor Phillips is spectacular. So. Okay. Yeah. Then the um the other ones that I've actually seen. It, getting some steam at least you know online is the uh, rocky patel's burn lounges seem to be getting popular and more of them seem to be opening up i think he just opened one up in i want to say pittsburgh uh, i haven't seen them yet yeah he has one in naples pittsburgh i want to say atlanta a couple other cities i don't think he has one like in las vegas but I i'm sure he'll try to open one there because there's you know usually a lot of lounges out there what else is there? In, so we've got Enfuego and then Enfuego and Henderson. They opened a new one called Cigar Box off the strip. I haven't been there. There's, but the woman that used to work at the one that you like moved over there. Jade, do you know Jade? At, at, at which place? Which place? So she worked at the Casa Fuente for many oh. years oh. and then went over to Cigar Box. Uh, I just, I never get there. It's not near anything. I also like. Um... Um, so, uh, the Las Vegas Cigar Outlet, and they, where is that? They, I believe, they claim to have the largest humidor in Nevada, and they have quite the selection. Um, you can follow them on social media. They do a lot of videos in, inside their humidor. Um, I don't remember exactly where that is actually. I've been there twice. I want to say. Um, there's, so there's that one. There's Cigar Warehouse, and then there's Enfuego, which I know is kind of like near where you are um which is cool too <laughs> the leaf the leaf in vegas josh just said it's by the rhino so now i know where it is <laughs> which one the uh one you were just talking about not the not cigar warehouse but the one before that the the las vegas cigar outlet yeah 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 um yeah that's a cool place they have a lot of stuff there yeah if you haven't been there you should go you should check that out uh, i'm just i'm loyal to my local right there we have private parties there. So when one of the reasons we chose Las Vegas for our company location was that every tech trade show eventually rotates through Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So instead of sponsoring them, we just kind of guerrilla market at the event and we host a, we host a cigar or like a private cigar event and ship everyone over to Enfuego and they're like, they'll close the place down for us so we can serve booze. It's a, uh, it's a pretty good time. So I just, Michael's like, every time I need something, I'm like, okay, can you find me this? He's just super reliable. And it's kind of like to keep my business at the place where they're like, oh, Carrie's here. <laughs> Instead of like, oh, hello, random person. So John, actually, I was going to ask you, so, uh, you know, not only, I guess, when you travel, but, you know, I guess also from like your business standpoint, you know, with you have retailers in Las Vegas, aside from like the touristy places that like we mentioned before, you know, these, these more of these like local cigar shops, like in Fuego and Warehouse and the outlet, you know, what, what are some of the, do you, uh, do you sell, do, how many of those places carry LFD and how many of those places have you actually been to and what do you know? I've been to all, I've been to all of them. They all sell another really good retailer in Vegas is called Belief. Okay. Um, it does a really good job too. Um, cigar box is awesome. Um, I'm, most of the time, honestly, I, I'm kind of like curious with this where like the, um, I really like the Davidoff lounge just because of the location that circular bar is great for people watching. Um, I also go to the Costa Monte Cristo quite a bit at the, um, at Caesar's palace. Uh, Cause we have a good connection with the, uh, the owner of that store. Um, and they're, they also own the cigar box as well, I believe. Um, but uh, yeah, great spots. I, I love Vegas. Smoking Vegas is great. And I know it's getting a little more challenging uh, with Corona. And then there's some, you know, local regulations that they're trying to work on uh, as part of the reopening to not have smoking, but, uh, but it's a great smoke environment. Fuego is fantastic. I mean, they got, it's a great venue. It's a great, it's in that town center, uh, which is beautiful. It's just a great spot. I think you're thinking about the Henderson one. Yeah. I'm thinking about the Henderson one. Yep. The one on Sahara is the one, like the one on Sahara is like four blocks from my office. So we end up there pretty often. Mm. It's a little, uh, it's a little less foofy. Like uh, the one in Henderson is, you know, beautiful club chairs. And I think it's better ventilated the, than the one on Sahara, but they have poker games at the one on Sahara and they're quite popular. 
I, uh, last time I was there, there's like a bunch of men that hang out, like retired men that hang out there every day and they watch family feud and they play family feud. And it's like, it's competitive. It's competitive family feud. It's like two o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon is like peak time. Yeah. Who would have thought that family feud would have been like the thing at a cigar lounge? Like everyone loads in, they're smoking and then they get off. Normally like you hear like cards or like dominoes. That's like the game. Those are the games of choice when you're, you know, in the cigar shop where you can play games. A family feud. That's a new one. I haven't heard that. That's interesting. I like that idea. I should try. You know what, John? I should propose that to Garofalo and be like, you know, what? you should host a family feud viewing time in the lounge. I don't know if he'll go for it, but uh, this thing in cigar lounges, everything gets competitive. You know, one of the big ones I do with a lot of lounges, Jeopardy's always on. Uh, that's another one. Jeopardy, Family Feud um, is huge. Uh, Wheel of Fortune a little bit, um, but any of those things, it's just, there's tons of stuff that, that these, again, it's people try to find things to do and then it ends up being really fun and then it turns into competition. <laughs> I know that they, they used to have, uh, you know, when they had the, the club and they had the card table at, at two guys, you know, in Salem, I've heard the stories of how, you know, they had that and it was great, but then people just started taking over and it became really clicky and then they were like, all right, we got to get rid of the card table because people will just camp out in here all day. And it'll be like the same five guys from open to close. And so, yeah, fortunately you have people, you know, that will do that and kind of take advantage of the, the situation with the lounges and, you know, the availability of, of space and, you know, letting other people in and stuff like that. You get the, the campers, so to speak, who just camp out in the lounge all day. What's the best lounge that you visited? Like what's your. Most of the lounges that I know are going to be around the New England area and Las Vegas because those are really the only areas where I've gone and really smoked and done cigar stuff. As I said, I was supposed to do a whole Florida trip and do a lot of cigar stuff down there. But as much as I love Casa Fuente, like I love that like because like I like Fuente and all that. But in terms of that lounge experience, I mean, I, my local shop is two guys smoke shop and I love them to death. And that's where I, you know, I, I do the Ashles podcast and I buy all my cigars there and I'm very loyal to them. And I, you know, I have a really good relationship with them, but in terms of like that going out and getting drinks and hanging out, I got to say for me, it's got to be twin smoke shop in London Dairy because it's, it's not, it's a little bit more low key. It, it's, it's got the, it's got the right vibe for me, you know, Friday nights, you know, they got the band in the corner, you know, they have an amazing, amazing selection of whiskeys and bourbons and all that stuff too. And I like that. So it's it, it, great drinks, good smokes, good atmosphere, good, good people, uh, really comfortable, plenty of space. Um, that's, that's kind of like my favorite spot to be. Yeah. Like when I go to Las Vegas, yeah, there's places I like to hang out in, but my favorite I would say would be the, the, the 724 lounge at twin smoke shop. That's gotta be my favorite. What what would be your favorite? Like out of all the lounges, what would you say your favorite is? The lounge I had the most fun at was like a like this a shitty bar in San Francisco. They're like they think there's only two places that you can actually smoke in San Francisco. This place is awesome. It's uh, what's it called? I don't know. It's like it's I can picture it in my head, and there's not enough room for anybody in it. So by the end of the night, you're all packed in like sardines, and you're afraid that someone's gonna burn your hair. And like it, everyone rolls out onto the street smoking, even though you're not supposed to. And it gets like, it's terrible. Like you need to wear goggles in that place. But it's such an interesting blend of just like every day, you know, somebody smoking an acid and then you know, a bunch of like finance tycoons smoking whatever ridiculous thing they brought in with them. And I just like, I had such a great time there. It has great memories for me. I met a bunch of people that I've actually kept in contact with. And I found that, like for me, traveling so much, I found that a cigar lounge is far less predatory than the hotel bar, right? Like I can go sit in a cigar lounge for three hours, smoke a cigar, chat with people. Nobody's trying to pick you up. Nobody's hit, like there's, it's not, um, nobody's aggressive. I've never had anybody be shitty to me there. I've never gotten into an argument. With, like it's just, everyone's chill. Most people aren't shittered. It's just a very calm evening. People come for a couple of drinks and a cigar and then they go home. Yeah. So it's been like my usual is like, okay, check into the hotel, figure out where I'm going to go smoke and uh, roll on out. It's, and called, that, it's called the Occidental. Yes. I don't, yeah, that, you guys hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Yeah. 
like it's all accidental. You know what it is? It it, it cut. I think it's it's on the it because Zoom so as we each talk it. I think it jumps and it cuts people off and stuff like that. So yeah, I don't know because yeah, Occidental Cigar Club. Which actually, since you bring that up, John, not to really like deter from the conversation, but that's it's been doing that more and more lately. It happened to us last week. We had a we had a show. We had Jim Price on from CLE Cigars, and uh, we had we had some audio issues where it just kept overlapping and cutting everybody off. So I don't know. I don't know if it's, it wasn't really doing Zoom really as a platform wasn't really doing that as much, but now it's it, doing it the last few weeks. It'll be better. It'll be better when we switch over to the other the other program because it'll be dialing in as separate feeds. And everybody, everybody talks at the same time, no matter what. Uh, so you, you can identify who's talking. But I, I have noticed that on Zoom uh, the last few weeks that it has been like that. So just so that all the viewers know, everyone who watches us, uh, we are getting off the Zoom platform because it is not ideal for our show and what we do. Um, we are just – we're kind of in the process of setting up our, our whole new show experience, our new platform. Um, we're going to be using a, a, a whole different program that's more dedicated for this and – the experience of the show will be much better and much clearer and we won't have these issues. So probably like next week, I would say is when we're going to have that up and running. So we won't have these little issues uh, like the overlapping, but John, I want to throw that question over to you as well, because you obviously, you know, being in the industry and traveling a lot and you primarily travel to cigar shops and lounges all over the country out of everywhere you've been and all the shops you work with and all that, what was like the one lounge where you went to and you were like, this so my spot. Yeah, so it's an easy it's an easy one for me. I I uh I started smoking and went to college in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Um so I my first my first real cigar experience was Corona. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, so fun. Yeah, I take like a two week trip every year where I take a week of vacation and we plan events around it. Um so Corona's really my place I got a lot of friends from college that are down there. Um you know, I've had people that have worked for me that that I bought cigars from when I was in college. Uh, so Corona for me is naturally my, my favorite place to go uh, just because it's where I started smoking uh, in the Northeast. You know, I, I really enjoy two guys just because of the relationship, same thing that you have there. It's a great spot. It's, it is stogie heaven. And, uh, and I also spend a lot of time at twin smoke shop, the, the Jack Daniels, 724 Jack Daniels bar. Um, but yeah, for me, it's easy. Corona, Corona is a place that I started smoking. And I, when I'm there, it's, it's like vacation, uh, it's relaxing. It's enjoyable. It's so much fun. I know everybody there. Uh, yeah, I get to see old friends. Uh, so that's, yeah, for me, it's an easy one just because that's where I started smoking, you know, almost 20 years ago. I think for me, I think Corona will, it sounds to me as, you know, I've been getting to know Corona, you know, from a distance that that one will probably take, take over and be my favorite when I do finally get down there at some point. Oh, there's a lot of Florida to explore though. I, this, like I, if you haven't been to Tampa yet, like Tampa is just a cigar city. It's everywhere. I, I've been told like Tampa, Orlando, and then it's obviously Miami is a huge spot too. So oh yeah. Those are all the cities that like I wanted to be. At. I was gonna go in the spring, and then obviously I, I couldn't go. So uh, they'll still be there. They'll still be there when you get there. They will. There's you know it'll yeah it'll it'll still happen. It's not like they're gone. So. But yeah, I, I think I think Florida might take the cake for me. I just haven't done it yet, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, like Two Guys is a great shop, and we love that shop. And they just they don't really have. It's not really like a lounge lounge. It's more of a retailer. It's a huge shop. It's the biggest in the world. But they don't have like the they don't have a bar. They don't do alcohol there. So that's kind of where like it kind of changes for us on that. It's a great shop to go and buy, but if you want the, the lounge and the alcohol, it's, it's different. So, um, for I me, picked up cigars after I quit drinking. So I've actually never had a, I've never had an alcoholic beverage with a cigar. Oh, that's right. You don't drink anymore. And I always no. about that. Yeah. So for you, yeah, I, I guess. Change. Hmm. Yeah. John, John went from, I don't even know what he used to drink because for me, all I've known is he just drinks box wine from the grocery store now. He could tell you all about boxed wine. Like. It's been a rough quarantine. I, uh, I'm <laughs> in a drinking phase right now, though. Uh, so I'm in a detox from quarantine. I got to make quarantine look good. I didn't get to indulge in anything through quarantine. I just had surgery, so I couldn't gain weight. And so I couldn't, I had to be really mindful of everything I ate. I couldn't smoke because I was post surgical, so I didn't get to enjoy that. I didn't have any vices through quarantine. It was a very boring quarter. 
my quarantine was interesting because I I met my girlfriend and that was cool and that was and everyone's like how the hell did you meet a girlfriend during quarantine and well we met online and then we just made it work we just zoomed for most of our introductory period and then eventually we started meeting up and hanging out and then like now everything's kind of normal for us because we see each other all the time but so that happened i lost weight because i was going through um a little bit of a health health change myself i i i had some some medical issues last year and i i had to change my diet and lose some weight and just kind of get into a better condition uh so i actually lost weight during quarantine most people are like, i gained weight so they, everyone was jealous of me because of that um and i ended up smoking more because I wasn't working for 10 weeks. I was, I was home. I could, I was laid off from work obviously because you know, our, our industry got all shut down. So I was at home. So I was like, well, I'll smoke and do all my cigar stuff. So I started smoking more, uh, which was kind of fun because I just took a lot of that time to try new stuff um, that I hadn't had before. Just started writing like random stuff online and I would just try like a lot of stuff I hadn't heard of before. Uh, found some good stuff, found a lot of not so good stuff that I, couldn't really finish i got like halfway through and i'm like yeah i'm not wasting my time um so yeah that was my quarantine experience and then me and john started doing this and i got to watch john experience new box wines every week until we got to a point a few weeks ago where he was like yeah i can't do it anymore with the box wine and he had to kind of retire the box wine but i was over here drinking like regular wine and then he pull out like the like, I don't even know like any of the brands, but he'd pull out like a, like a carton of wine. And he'd be like, I got this beautiful Pinot Grigio and he'd crack the box <laughs> open. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. You got to like kind of hold it and figure out how to use the little spout thing, get it into the glass without everything spilling. My yep. box wine days are over, but I remember them fondly. <laughs> Problem with box wine was just the amount of consumption because it's, it's like five bottles per bo per box go to town and you have no idea what was going on. So it started to become problematic. I'm like, I just can't drink this large amount of this garbage wine. Uh, so I just switched back to bottles. It was pricier, uh, but it, it was better for my consumption um, and just more enjoyable. It was just a more sustainable thing, but there was a good two months where it was box wine every day. It was mid March to April when, you know, things were rough and it was still snowing up here and there was no hope. Not really uh, a sangria season. No. No. So, you know, it's, it's, I switched over luckily conveniently and at the right time I made the right decision and it worked out. Yeah. I, when he first told me he was drinking box wine, I mean, he was doing a lot of the smaller, like little boxes, but I just remember joking with him. Like, what do you got? Like a whole bunch of cake. Like a juice box. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was, we had that were kind of like the size of like, you know, the coconut water that comes in the cardboard, like carton. Mm -hmm. He was drinking a lot of stuff that was like that size, but then I remember joking with him, like, what do you have, like a couple of cases, like Franzia wine over there that you're just like cracking open every night and just putting away like it's your job. <laughs> now, aren't they marketing, like, I think they're moving a lot of wine to that kind of packaging now. Like I've seen a lot of um, less, um, I know, less traditional, less less classy looking, but apparently it's better. Like the screw top, for example, is better for the wine. Like it, it's better for the wine than the cork is. Well, yeah, because you can reseal it. I mean, once you pop the cork, you pop unless you stuff the cork back in the bottle. I mean, it's open. The air it begins to aerate and it changes the profile of the wine. But just from a long term storage standpoint, does the wine not stay? Not fresher is the wrong word, but would the quality of the wine not maintain better without the porous nature of the cork? It does. And they make some higher end wines that come in packaging like that. Um, you know, essentially when you open a bottle, even if it's a twist top or a cork, uh, once air is introduced to it, it's going to start to degrade. The concept with the box wine is that with a little spigot on the bottom is you're not introducing any air to what's ever in the bag on the inside. Um, so it does keep it a little better. And there are some higher end, you know, better quality wines in boxes. Well, my grocery store just doesn't have, I said, I'm in the middle of the sticks up here. Uh, so it was, it was inexpensive, headache inducing wine. <laughs> One of the interesting things about wine, I guess, and, and freshness and stuff. Um, my sister works for a marketing firm here in Boston. And one of her clients is Coravin. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Coravin. Very, very familiar. C Carrie, have you heard of Coravin? No, but I also haven't drank in 16 years, so it's not like I'm up to date on 
So it's more of a restaurant tool. Uh, you can you can have it as an individual. They're a little pricey for an individual. It's, so it's it's more of a and it's more of a restaurant thing because it's a device that actually punctures the cork in the bottle and allows you to pour out a glass and then the, and then the needle comes out. And the idea is that because of the cork, when you pull the needle out, it just seals itself back up. So you, you can still keep a sealed bottle fresh without pulling the whole cork out. And then the bottle's open and then that's it. So like when you're putting vodka into a watermelon. Kind of, I guess. It has a little canister on it that has argon gas. Mm -hmm. So it reintroduces gas into it so the oxygen doesn't go in. Um, so it just, it maintains it. And uh, it's a really, really cool system. Um, I haven't used one yet, but I, I, I'm definitely going to get one this year for Christmas uh, because, it's, again, if you want just a glass of a nice glass of wine, you can just pour one glass of wine. You don't have to open up the whole bottle and feel like you have to drink it, which I is how I've I never opened a bottle of wine and not thrown the cork in the garbage. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, you want to do uh, you want to get on to the soap review here? I mean, I'm feeling like I got to clean these hands. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm waiting on you, man. I, I, I'm excited now. Now, now I got it. Now. Yeah, I know. Now Carrie has to see what the, what the hype's all about. All right. So I got my bucket here. This is a bucket of water. We do this very rustic. Uh, I got my torch. The torch has nothing to do with the soap review except light. Uh, so today we're going to be doing, uh, I don't think this is trademarked. I think this is a locally made soap. It's called love your skin. I did look it up online and there is a big brand called love your skin. Uh, but, uh, so this is a local one here made in Maine. Uh, so love your skin jasmine um, it contains a combination of comfrey and calendula infused saponified olive palm coconut almond and soy oils may also contain organic oats herbs, spices cocoa powder glycerin essential or fragrance oil color contains no animal products and is handmade and cut in their kitchen and this is made by Kathy Bradford and Jana Stevens of, uh, of Maine. So let's go. It's got a little, it's nice packaging. Got this plastic wrap around it, kind of like a cellophane type thing. It's got this little hemp tie here. So one of the first things we do is when we get into this, we take the smell. So uh, this is jasmine, so it should smell of jasmine. They got this tied up real nice. All right. I didn't smell anything through the cellophane, which is, you can sometimes smell, it's a very faint smell of jasmine through there. Here we go. Not overwhelming, but I, I'd give it on the, on the dry scent here, I'd give it about a six out of 10 in terms of flavor, uh, scent intensity. Um, and it's, it's kind of waxy. Another thing I, you know, don't take my fingernail here. Um, it does scrape off a little, but it's, it's, um, when you scrape it, it's a, a soft little crust essentially, uh, but it's, it is a little oily. Uh, it's not overly oily, uh, but you can feel that you've touched something, a little bit of stickiness. Um, so sense of jasmine, definitely. Uh, one thing I like to do is wipe my hands first before I get into the soap. So we're gonna wet here. This is water from Lincoln, Maine. Um, this is famous Lincoln, Maine water. It goes into water uh, that goes into bottles of Poland Springs water. We're one of the reservoirs for that. So we get nice and wet here. So right now we're getting, we're going to talk about suds. We're going to talk, if we see if we get any foam, we're going to talk about hand feel and coverage. Uh, so right now I'm not getting a lot of foam or suds. So it's, it's a lot of, let's say, it's, it's slippery, getting a lot of slippery, a lot of oil, uh, but not overly oil. It's just like a light oil. So I'll rub it up here a little bit and then we'll lather with my hands. So very slippery, much more slippery than the holiday soap. Um, this definitely feels like a homemade soap. It's not a lot to it in terms of, you know, a lot of uh, commercial soaps add things that create extra suds and that feeling of grittiness on your hands. This is a very clean. You can see here, there's not a lot of, there's no suds really. Uh, Jasmine's faint, definitely smelling some of the oils, but on a suds level, not a lot, which I don't mind. Uh, it's not messy, it's not all over the place. A little more wet here. Adding a little more water, it's a very clean, uh, it's, it's transparent. Uh, the bubbles are like transparent. It's not uh, that traditional, that white lather that you get. Uh, so it's a natural, kind of a natural color on my 
And so I'll give it a little bit more here. A big thing with the soap too is after you rinse it off, uh, the intensity of the scent. I don't like it to linger. One of the issues that I have with soaps is sometimes it lingers and you wash your hands and say you're going to eat and the only thing you're tasting or smelling is the scent that's in there, like a hand sanitizer with aloe vera. Uh, you, you put that on and then all you smell is aloe. Uh, so I like it to, to be fresh and clean, have a little bit of the scent, but not have it overpower when you go back to doing normal things like smoking a cigar or eating. Uh, but this is super clean. Like it, I, I kind of be honest with you, I don't even know if I had to put my hands in water um, to do this. It's definitely taking off some of the black soot I had. Uh, it did a pretty good job of that. Not on the under of my hands, but the under of my hands are a little rough. Um, but no, it's pretty good. Like it's clean, very clean on the hands. So let's take this bucket down here. I'm done about four dumps into the water and it's clear, cleaned it off. Um, before I dry, um, the oil's gone, the slipperiness is gone. The scent is now probably at about a, a one or a two. Let's see. John, you're going to have to come up with your own branded soap. You're going to have to work with yeah. some soap manufacturer and come up with. I'll say one of the things that's cool with natural soaps is, uh, which, is nat which is obvious probably, is that you really feel natural doing it. It doesn't feel like I had something that was super soapy. I feel refreshed. My hands feel clean. Uh, they feel better than they did before. I don't feel like, uh, you know, some of these soaps are a little bit more harsh on your hands, so you feel like your skin's drying up. Um, this here just feels like, um, you know, my hands are back to normal. I, I got, one thing I will say is my grip, um, it definitely cleaned off uh, the cleanliness. It definitely cleaned whatever, any dirt or anything I had or sweat or anything on my hands because uh, there's kind of a, a natural, I wouldn't say stickiness, but there's a, and not a film. There's, there's no film on my hands because it feels fresh. The air on it feels good. Uh, but my hands are it kind of refreshed it back to a natural state where I just have a naturally good, a good feel yeah it's about a one on the uh the scent um have I, i've been rating this out of 10 i can't remember what i gave the holiday soap um i should have written that down but i give it like a six nine or something like that seven one seven one i, I definitely like this better i think it's clean i think it's clean uh, there's not a bunch of soap suds all over the place, but I still got the, I still have the feeling of being clean. I'm going to give this a seven, uh, seven, eight. Wow. Seven, eight. Really? That's kind of high. Yeah. We're going to give it a seven, eight. I, I think it's a really good soap. Um, I said, I like the natural side of it. I think I'm going to be more keen on natural soaps. Another thing I like about it too, is in the nature of the soap review, there's not a lot of suds on the soap. It's kind of like what it was before. And the fact that it doesn't have this huge stickiness to it when I put my hands on it. I, you know, I say, it was like, oh, I don't even have to really dry my hands off. Mm. Um, it makes it easy to transport the soap after, you know, or move it, you know, move the soap or take it to a different area because it's just not all sorts of suds. I don't feel like I have to wash my hands again or put water on my hands again once I touch the soap. So yeah, seven, eight, uh, I'll mark that down. The, um, the homemade in Kathy Bradford and Janice Stevens Kitchen, uh, Love Your Skin Jasmine, uh, seven, eight. Wow. So that's it right there, Carrie. It's, this is John in, in the soap reviews. I like this. I see. I think I need like a, an extended soap review to decide like, is this a soap that we use for showering or just for washing our hands? Uh, you know, and I, I, I'm with you on that. I, I'm interested on this one, how it would feel on the rest of the body because it felt great on the hands. Uh, so I, I actually may shower with this tonight. Maybe I'll give it a shot and see how it goes. It'd be worth, uh, you know, worth the, uh, worth the try on that one. But in regards to hands, I like it. Um, I, I definitely like it. I don't feel filmy, but I, I do know that I've washed my hands and uh, it just feels good. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to say is, you know, it, there's a difference between washing your hands and actually showering with soap. So it, I guess it would really depend on how you plan on using the soap as, uh, as you, you know, rate a soap. You know, is it better for hand washing, showering, or bath, if you take baths? You don't strike me as a bath kind of guy, though. Yeah, you never know. I'm not a big bath guy. I'm a hot tub guy. But, um, but yeah, I'll take a bath every once in a while. This is definitely not a bathing soap by any means. This would be a 
I think this would be a good soap to bring with you on the road or bring with you into the wild. Uh, you like this would be a good soap to use in a river or a lake um, because it's not a bunch of suds uh, all over the place. Uh, you know, it said it's it's natural soap, so it's naturally made, all natural ingredients. Uh, so you wouldn't be introducing anything into the wild that wasn't natural. Um, so I, I think this would be good for showering. It, it, for me, it's just very clean. I was I was surprised how clean it was. Not a lot of suds, um, but it was still had you know good coverage. Um, you know, I, I again, I'm looking forward to trying some more natural soaps. Uh, John, I have one question for you. Could you rub your nuts with this soap, and would it burn? That's all I got to know. <laughs> it wouldn't burn at all. Um, there was no uh, stringent. No <laughs> I had to know. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess it's that's the know. real Could question, be right? Be on any part of the body. But have you ever used a soap that burned you before? I have. Yeah. Where are you finding this burning soap? Well, soaps that have like cheap soap oils or things like that in it. Any oil that that has a kind of exfoliating sense to it, um, or you know, if you take a tea tree and use it in your hair, mm -hmm. uh, you know, anything with tea tree oil has some intensity to it. Uh, so you want to be careful where you would put something like that, or or how long you would leave it there. I mean, this was this would be fine for any period for any part of your body. It was very. Uh, not a lot of no irritants to it at all no scratchiness after no itchiness um, so nah this would be perfect for any body part okay so that covers the soap review that's that's it that's that's John actually I would tune in to watch the soap reviews I think this is uh, an excellent addition to your show it's definitely different and it's something that it's new we haven't been doing it we just started it last week and I'm gonna start sending soap yeah, that's. We'd uh, be happy to review it and yeah. we'd to debate it with you. We'd, we'd be happy to have you on from time to time if you'd like to discuss it. Uh, you know, there's just nobody out there doing it. You know, in my opinion, you know, there's somebody going to do these soap reviews, and there's definitely nobody doing it in our industry, um, in the way we're doing it. We just do it better, and we, we hope to improve. I think that one of the point that needs to be made for those who might not necessarily realize, but a lot of the soap review, as much as John started it as a parody or not really parody, like in mocking the coronavirus on the whole like, hand washing situation. It's also kind of a parody on the pizza review by Dave Portnoy of Barstool Sports for those who, who know who that is, who every day goes online and he goes to a different shop and he buys the pizza and reviews it right out front. And I mean, Dave's obviously a little bit more, what's the right word? Well, he's out there. He's a little bit more of a dick. Uh, so he's not shy about being extremely negative about stuff he doesn't like. But he gets more animated about it, and it's it's entertaining. So I think John took that kind of approach and tried to parry that with something as simple as soap. I mean, it could have been anything. It could have been who knows. But he well, another big reason for the soap reviews, it, was, it wasn't just mock. It wasn't really mocking the coronavirus. It was we were talking about people washing their hands and this and that. And as you know from traveling, it's shocking how many people don't wash their hands. It's true. Like I see people yeah. just wash their hands all the time. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, this is something that needs to have more attention. People need to do this. It's stupid that we have to have this discussion of washing your hands. So let me do something that's so ignorant and stupid. And even, I'll be honest. I have people that comment on my soap reviews that I've seen them not wash their hands before. And I'm like, oh, you love this, but I've seen you not wash your hands before. Uh, so it was just bringing attention to something that's important. It was fun. And it is a parody. I mean, it'll always be a parody, but at the same time, wash your damn hands. It's true. There is there is a serious message here, and that's just wash. Your, have good hygiene. You know, like brush your teeth, wash your hands, take a shower once a day at least. I like to take two. But, I mean, you have to compulsively wash your hands when you're traveling. Like the first year you go on the road, you get every freaking disgusting flu, cold, whatever. And our industry is kind of incestuous, right? Like we're all together every day and then we're going on to the next city together like there's groups of people that just travel from city to city and one person gets sick and then it just goes through the whole industry like you train yourself pretty early on like you don't touch your face you don't like you clean your like i've been cleaning my airline armchairs and trays for years now it's not time I it's not common if you didn't travel all the time i don't think you'd think about it now people will. I remember my, I think it was my grandmother who, I, met, I remember this first, I first started hearing this from, is when she would travel, like she would bring like her own sheets and like blankets and stuff with her. She wouldn't use the stuff from the hotel because she's like, 
you know, some hotels they don't wash everything, and so she would just she'd make her own bed with her own sheets. Uh, like my, my mom got this from her and has conveyed it to me about like you know when you travel, like you first get into a hotel room, doesn't matter how nice it is, you know, lights all everything and don't touch like the the, the remote. Don't touch the remote. Yeah, the remote. Take the bag from the ice bucket, put your hand over it, and then pull the remote mm-hmm. through that, and tie it off. Yeah, that's a big one. The remote. That's the that and maybe the phone in the room too. The phone obviously probably gets a lot of a lot of touching, you know, of co- over the course of people staying in there. So yeah, there's a lot of like, as much as it's funny, it is kind of serious too because it's like especially you, you guys travel so much, you come in contact with a lot of things that a lot of other people have come in contact, and you do have to be mindful of that. So I can understand where he's coming from uh, with the soap review. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, th- so that's that, that's the whole soap review. Um, and like I said, I think he's going to be writing soap reviews online now. So we look forward to those as well. Those will, uh, definitely be an interesting addition to what we got going on over here. Um, but yeah, I kind of lost track of time, but we are definitely in the overtime phase. Yeah. Um, I am plugging along nicely, not too fast, but nicely through my second cigar. Um, I generally smoke a little faster, uh, not really specifically because of cigars. I, I tend to do things really quick just because that's how I am. I have a little bit of ADD, so I go through things quick. So I am more of a faster smoker, so I'm already th- almost through my second cigar. How far are you, have you finished your uh, cigar you had going over there? Uh, I got halfway through. Yeah. I just honestly, I have to really moderate right now. Right. The uh, idea of like just the idea of getting sick it just doesn't appeal to me at all. Yeah, I uh, over here you know we obviously everyone's dealing with the coronavirus and all that fallout and in the whole wor- the state of the world right now with that. But you know, and where we are, you know, we have higher risk people in the house too, so we're we're really nervous about it. We really don't want to get sick. I hate being sick. And I'm not even shy about it. I'll be honest. I'm the biggest baby when I get sick. I don't. I am miserable and I'm very cranky and I don't like to be touched or bothered. And I'm just like I just basically lay there and in torturous pain in my mind mostly and just be like I hate this. You know, some people deal with being sick. I feel like better than others. For me, I'm one of those people. I'm like, uh, I just I hate the world when I'm sick. So yeah, I really can't imagine getting this coronavirus right now and having bad effects from it because I will be. Uh, I will be absolutely miserable, and then I'll be all angry that I actually got it. Um, another statistic. I hope that I have like I have friends who t- like we all went for antibody tests, mm-hmm. so that we could all start hanging out again. And some of my friends who I was kind of partying with in like we went to a day club, we went to a strip club, we were sharing cigars, we were sharing glasses, and a couple of them t- had um, positive antibody tests. So I was kind of hopeful that I'd already had it and didn't know it, but no, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. I've been tested once. I had to be tested uh, at work because of my situation and, you know, working major league baseball facility, you know, when the camps opened and everything started to happen uh, about two weeks ago, you know, when I had to be tested and I think I might even have to be tested again, probably a few times. Uh, we, we had a bunch of meetings and we were told, you know, like, there could be some very frequent tests. Anytime someone just doesn't feel right, even if they don't have it, we're going to test everybody every single time. Um, luckily, it's good though. I like, I'd much rather work for a company that was concerned about my safety and my coworker's safety and the yeah. client's safety. Yeah. And it's especially, you know, with, with the players too, they don't want to get down to the players and then the whole team gets it and then they have to shut it all down. So, you know, it's, it's keeping us safe. It's keeping them safe. Obviously, um, the test that we got, I don't know. I, I heard through the grapevine that the test we got was different than what like the team got the team, the team, the, the method of testing that they had was like a spit test, which I hadn't heard of before. I had been hearing about the one where they jam a long Q-tip, like all the way up into like your brain. Um, my best friend had that one done where they, they jammed the long Q-tip up into his head. And then they told us we were getting tested. And I was like, oh, no, I don't want to deal with that. And they were like, oh, it's not that bad. We just do a short little swab just in, mm-hmm. the, just in the front of your nose. And that wasn't that bad. But So luckily, I haven't had to have the long, the long test yet. But 
Apparently, also there's a there's a spit test out there for the coronavirus too. I haven't really seen that or heard about it, but apparently it's out there. So, yeah, here's to <coughs> a lot more coronavirus testing probably for me. Um, John, have you you haven't had to get tested for yet, right? I haven't had it yet. There haven't been uh, really up in my little town here. There really isn't. Um, there hasn't been any cases. Yeah. And the state of Maine's pretty low in general. We're pretty socially distanced regardless. Um. So there just hasn't been, and I haven't done any traveling yet. I was going to have one when I came back from Atlanta next week, uh, but that trip's been postponed, so I won't be doing that. But um, so we'll see what goes. But so I don't, I don't anticipate having one. Um, if I start getting on an airplane sometime soon, doing some trips, I may. But we'll see where it goes uh, from there. But it'll be a case by case basis. It was, it was interesting when uh, Nick Perdomo was up here a few weeks ago, and I was with him. We were talking about it, and he said that he thought his son Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas Perdomo, uh, who works uh, Perdomo Cigars, is uh, he's like, I swear, he's like, Nicholas, I think had it like earlier in the year, like in February, when it first really started to go global. And he goes, because he never gets really sick. And he even when he does, he doesn't really miss work. He goes, he was laid up at home for like four or five days. And he was just like in the worst condition I've ever seen him. And he's like, I swear, I, I swear he had the coronavirus. But um I think there's definitely going to be a lot of that too. Like Carrie was saying, there's, there's people who could have had it, didn't even know, and they have the antibodies and they're, you know, maybe that's why they haven't gotten it. And maybe that's why there's a, a percentage of the population that hasn't like gotten it and shown s signs of it. Cause they, maybe they had it, whether they knew it or not, or they had symptoms or not. Now they have the antibodies. So, I mean, I'm not, and I'm not too like up on the science of it. So I don't know, like if you have the antibodies, is it, I wouldn't say, it doesn't mean you're necessarily immune to it, right? You just have a higher immunity to it. If you don't know, they don't. It means you've been infected with it. Yeah. Right. And your body fought it off, created the antibody, and then. Yeah. Well, you could but it's not like, uh, it's not a common test, and they're two, like, they're $200. So it's not like everybody's going to run and get an antibody test unless they have a reason to do so. Yeah. I was just curious and hopeful and thinking like, okay, well, I'm going to travel way more if I've already had it. But since I haven't, I'm wearing a mask and behaving myself. Yeah. And that's really all you can do right now. And just, just be careful and be cautious and, and just try to, you know, do the best you can not to wash your hands. We have a good soap to recommend. Yeah. Wash your hands. It's made in Kathy's kitchen in Maine. You'll like it. It's actually available. This was given as a gift to my mother. So I don't even know if this is something that's available. I've never even seen it before. And it was, it, my, it was given to my mother as a gift and then it was, ended up on my, it ended up in my bedroom. Uh, so it was the first soap that I saw and it's been sitting there for about six months. So I was like, that's getting reviewed today. So, but I think they could sell it. We should get on that. I think we have to look up recipes now. We're going to start making our own. That's actually a good idea. If anyone could do it, it'd be John. He, I, I could, uh, next week he'll be like, I found out how to make it. And here's my first bar of soap I made from, from scratch. That would actually be a good idea. But um, we are getting towards the end of the show, so we are going to be wrapping this up soon. Um, Carrie, since you are the guest, I wanted to you know, defer to you and see if there's any closing remarks you had, anything you want to say um, before we wrap up the show. No, it was nice to actually smoke with people. Right. I haven't uh, haven't had the opportunity to go to a lounge or like sit in a group sit in a group with like strangers or you know people you see once in a while for a long time so it was really enjoyable. Yeah, I mean that's kind of why we're doing this, you know, it's just it's it's just a way to get people together and smoke together and have people, you know, just watch along with us and smoke and it's... I've worn lipstick in months so it was like awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh John, is there anything that you wanted to say uh before we close up? Yeah, we got uh the first episode of Hacking Gourmet after it changed over. So it's episode 1.15, technically episode 15. Uh, Monday on Facebook Live, Hacking Gourmet. Uh, Chef Jam, we have my buddy Chef KB, uh, Chef to the Stars uh, from KB Cuisine on the show. Uh, we'll be, Brian and I will be cooking pork dishes. So that'll be uh, Monday on Facebook Live, Hacking Gourmet. Uh, so that should be exciting. We're unveiling our new uh, logos and everything like that. Uh, they can follow that on Hacking Gourmet uh, on Instagram, hackinggourmet.com online, and always on Facebook, 
and YouTube. All of the episodes are up there. And um, we also just had our fireworks extravaganza on the 4th of July, and that's available on all the YouTube channels too. So Hacking Gourmet, I am on to the Airbender Maduro Chisel here. Fantastic, one of my favorite smokes. Um, and uh, Lincoln, Maine is ahead in the uh, town of uh, best town in Maine championship. So I, I've been voting. I've been voting and following it. So, uh, yeah, good luck to Lincoln, Maine in the morning. But, no, thank you so much for coming on. It was a blast talking with you. Hopefully we can all smoke a cigar in person sometime. Florida. Florida. Kelly. We'll have to meet up at Corona. That'll be the, definitely the, the spot to meet up at. That'll be a good time. I'm supposed to be in Miami August 23rd or 24th for a week. So if you uh, find yourself available – Absolutely. And I, I traditionally, uh, I generally usually live in Miami. So I live downtown Miami. Uh, so if you're down there and we're down there, absolutely. I'd love to get together. All right. And then for everyone at, uh, at home who's watching us next week, we have Terrence Riley from Agonois Leaf joining us. So uh, I'm going to be smoking the new um, Supreme Leaf that just came out from Agonois Leaf. And we will talk to Terrence about that and all things Agonois Leaf. So don't miss that episode. We're excited about that. Same time, Thursdays at 8, and like I said, next week we should be debuting a new platform for our show, so might be a little bit different. Hopefully it's going to run a lot better, and we'll have a lot more uh, a lot more interactive features with the show. Um, and other than that, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for watching with us. Carrie, thank you for joining us. John, soap reviews, good as usual. Um, I'd like to expand on them a little bit, though. We'll have to talk about that. Uh, after I have a couple of ideas but other than that we're going to wrap it up and we will see you guys next week